Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at an Astrophysics AP130 GTX, perhaps one of the most desired refractor ranges from per perhaps the most desired telescope manufacturer of all time. Now the AP130 started life not as an astrophysics product, but as a Brandon. And I think back then nobody foresaw what this thing was going to become. I had one of those things in here. It was a 130 millimeter F8 version, baby blue refractor with a Kristen triplet. And today collectors know that that is a telescope worth getting. Now, by today's standards, that Brandon is not all that great, but people buy them for their historical significance, not necessarily for their optical or mechanical performance. Having said that, and despite the rarity and the importance to our hobby, there were only 99 or 100 of those made, depending on which story you believe. The last Brandons I saw go went for not a lot of money. Same thing for the original 127 millimeter blue speckled finish official astrophysics product not a few years later. And I remember seeing these ads in Astronomy Magazine thinking, why would anybody pay so much for a small refractor? And of course today we'd all kill to pay those prices for astrophysics refractors. But even then, I've seen some of those, and I had one of those in here also, despite their rarity and again for their historical significance, those things did not sell for that much money. The last few that I saw went for just under $3,000. So if you're a collector, it might be something that's worth seeking out if you can find one. So if you're looking for a state-of-the-art refractor that you're going to actually use day in and day out, you really do want one of the new white-tubed versions. And there have been many different variants of the AP-130. I've seen many of them. I have not seen all of them. I'm not even sure I'm even aware of all of them. I'm going to put a link in the description below to a much-quoted article by the late Thomas Back. It takes astrophysics refractors' history up through the early to mid-2000s. So I've seen probably more 130s than any other aperture. It's probably because they made the most variants of them and also because it tends to sit in a sweet spot. The stowaways and the travelers tend to be in the portable category and the ones bigger than the 130s tend to take really big mounts. So the 130 really is in a sweet spot for something that's good for general purpose use. These are some of the best telescopes I've ever seen in my life, and in fact, Mike's AP130 F8 might hold the title for the best refractor that I've ever seen in, in my life. But I'll tell you what, this 130 GTX that I have here might give it a run for its money. So astrophysics, of course, is as well known today for their waiting lists as they are for the quality of their products. And in fact, as of filming right now, I think they've even closed the waiting list. You can't even get on it. You have to wait to get on the waiting list. Go figure, right? So there are, there are two versions of this new AP130 GT, which was the version that had the 2.7 inch focuser for $6,500 or thereabouts, and this version that has the 3.5 inch focuser at $7,500. As of filming right now, this is the only one that's been listed on their website as being available, but that may change. Models do tend to come in and out of the astrophysics lineup. Check their website for details. And yes, you're paying an extra thousand dollars just to get a focuser that's one inch more in diameter. So if you really want one of these things and you don't want to wait, you're going to have to navigate the murky waters of the used market. And things can get quite painful here. I've seen these telescopes sell for well above retail. Recently, I saw both Travelers and Stowaways go for over $6,000. Those were originally $1,900 telescopes back in the day. And spending the money here may only get you the optical tube. If you order it either from the factory or if you get a used one, you're going to be buying rings and plates and adapters and field flatteners and diagonals. And my goodness, if you don't have a mount, you're going to wind up getting one of their mounts. The mounts, by the way, have waiting lists almost as long as the optical tubes. You could easily wind up spending two to three times the $7,500 that you just spent on the optical tube itself. I know, life isn't fair, is it? Okay, so let's go over a couple of the features of this telescope. It does have a sliding dew shield here, but it's got a couple of other things too. Though They're calling this an airline portable telescope. Now, this thing is quite long. It's also quite heavy. They're listing it at 18 pounds, but by the time you put everything on it, 
you're easily in the low to mid 20s here. But when you, dist when you retract the dew shield, it actually comes apart here, and they actually show a picture of this on their website, that you can stack the two pieces on top of each other, and it will fit into an airline carry-on piece of luggage. Another thing here is there is a knurled knob here with a so-called captain's wheel. If you can see that this is a locking ring. So if you loosen the locking ring, you are able to change the angle of the focuser. And this is often done for photographic purposes because you might want to frame something a little bit differently. And the machining of this is precise enough that you won't have to worry about refocusing. And this is probably the only brand that I know of Takahashi might be the other one where I would completely trust this. I would not bother to refocus. The focuser itself is a two-speed unit with a nine-to-one ratio on the fine focus versus the coarse focus. And given the mass of this focuser itself, it is quite smooth. There are also plenty of holes drilled in the top and the bottom of the rings, as well as mounting screws here to mount finders and auto guiders and whatever else you need to put on here. Okay, so as far as observing notes go, and I don't know if you're like this, but this is what tends to happen to me with a very good telescope. I show up with a pad and paper and things that I wanna look at and things that I wanna do. I've invited guys over here, and at the end of the evening, the pad is blank. So it's actually the opposite of what I expect would happen, that we would get very serious and look at this and look at that. But what winds up happening with a telescope like this is you wind up just, you know, having fun with it. I mean, there's a couple of things that happen. Like, first of all, when you look at something, the telescope just gets out of the way. That's the best compliment that I can give to any piece of optics is that you're just not even aware that it's there. You're enjoying the view through the eyepiece, you're looking out into space, and there's really nothing between you and the sky. At least that's the perception that you have. And the second thing that happens is at the end of the evening, you tend not to say, well, wasn't it great that we saw this? Or wasn't it that great when we saw Enki's division or we split double stars of sub arc second? You know, you never say those things with a really great telescope. You tend to just say, boy, we had fun tonight. So another thing that happens to me visually is that you have the sense that the telescope is better than you are. I mean, you do something and you walk away feeling, you know what? I think I could have done a little bit more than that. And that's definitely the case, at least for me, with imaging. If you're going to be taking images through this, the visual back comes out like this. Let's set that aside for a moment. And this is the field flattener. Now, I don't know if you can tell just how serious a hunk of glass and metal this is, but the field flattener, the spacer, the back that terminates, in this case, to a cannon bayonet, this weighs almost four pounds by itself. And the field flattener itself is over a thousand dollars. And you've got to add the spacers and all that stuff to it. So this is how you configure it for imaging use. So I am far from the best astrophotographer. And like I said, I had the sense, no matter how many images I took through this, that it was better than I was. Okay, so the odds are, if you're watching this, you're probably never going to own any astrophysics telescope. I mean, you're, you're just not, just be practical about this. But it is possible that you may know somebody who does. And when you go and visit your friend who has an astrophysics refractor, they're going to do two things for you. I mean, in the daytime, there's the same two things that every astrophysics refractor owner are going to do for you. I wanna point these out so you're prepared when you go over to see this person. The first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna open up the case and they're gonna ask you to smell the foam, okay? I, they're gonna do this, all right, they, they are. So, I, I mean, I, I know this is video, but 
Oh yeah. It's a very distinctive smell. Nothing else smells like the astrophysics foam. The bouquet is, is, is sharp. It's, it's a strong smell. This is not a mild, musty type smell. This is a very sharp smell. Okay, so the second thing they're going to do is they're gonna pull the eyepiece out of the diagonal and ask you to listen to it. So I'm gonna go ahead and unclip this microphone and do this. So try to get past the scraping noise of the eyepiece coming out of the holder and listen for something else. Okay, you ready? Did you hear that? I'll, I'll do it again. Hear the thunking noise? It's supposed to demonstrate the preciseness of the machining here, but I think they just like hearing the thunking noise. So there you have it, a brief look at the AP130 GTX refractor telescope. I hope you someday get a chance to look through one of these as I have. This was borrowed from a friend and I've kept it far too long. Of course I have, I'm no dummy, but I do need to look at getting it back to him. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.